I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and paying my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to thank the organisers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the dignitaries in the room, um, particularly uh, the Vice-Chancellor, um, the Chief Medical Officer of Australia and um, Senator Humphreys um, and anyone else I've missed. But I'd also particularly like to thank all the members of the public who are here and I'd particularly like to acknowledge my family, so my mum, my dad and my daughter. Um, it's really nice to be able to have a, a, a gathering that brings together um, all of us and, and I think that one of the one of the awful things about smoking, but one, about the, one of the great things is that it's a problem that unites us. Uh, very few people are untouched in terms of themselves or their families by smoking. So I'm just going to start with a bit of background about smoking and health, and then I'm going to talk to you about the specific results we have from Australia. I'm going to talk about that in the context of international findings, and then talk about the implications. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to have with us uh, a couple of the people, Margie Thiessen and Harry Kouros, I think, yeah, um, who've been a, a really a big part of the implementation and the development of ANU going smoke free. And I know that there are a number of other people in the audience who've been involved in tobacco control policy. So I'm hoping that one of the big things about this talk is to bring together the research and the, uh, and the action. Um, so Goethe says that thinking is easy and acting is difficult and putting one's thoughts into action is the hardest thing in the world. So we in universities pride ourselves on the quality of our thinking. Uh, but what Goethe says is that actually taking those thoughts and putting them into action is incredibly difficult, particularly because it's sort of a messy real world out there. But I would add to that, that if you do something that's, that really works, that's really effective, well then you're really in trouble. Um, and Certainly in terms of tobacco control, where really Australia is a world leader, if you do something that's really effective, you'll find yourself not only in the highest court in the country, but possibly the highest court on the planet. So just bearing that in mind, um, when I started work on, on smoking and mortality, one of the major comments I had was, why on earth would you do that? We know that smoking's bad for you. It says it on the packet. And I would absolutely agree that it is well established that uh, smoking increases the risk of premature mortality. But one of the things that I hope you will um, be convinced of by the time I finish my lecture is that magnitude matters. So it's not just a question of whether it's bad for you, but how bad it is for you actually matters. The other thing is that um, the risks related to smoking vary according to time and place. So they vary according to the stage in the tobacco epidemic uh, that, the, that the country is, and they also vary according to location in terms of the nature of the epidemic in that particular place. So it's very, very important to have local evidence. Um, and the other thing is that Australia, because of its uh, really outstanding record in tobacco control, provides a unique context which contrib can contribute to the international context. So one of the things that I think is really important is to remember that the forefront of knowledge differs from places from discipline to discipline. And even though it says it on the packet, there remains a forefront of knowledge on tobacco and on tobacco and mortality. So I'm going to talk now about global smoking. It's a massive problem and it's getting worse. And I think a lot of people uh, think that um, because uh, we've got re reducing rates in Australia that somehow as a problem it is solved or it's old hat. But in fact, we have around one billion daily smokers in the world today. And that's actually about a third of the men on the entire planet are current smokers and around 7% of women. On average, they smoke 15 cigarettes a day. This is the um, map of the world in terms of smoking. Um, the red areas represent areas of high smoking prevalence. This top part of the, of the chart is men and this bottom part is women. So what you can see is a huge concentration, particularly across Asia. And if you look at Australia, around Australia, um, our immediate region has <coughs> a, a very distinct tobacco problem. The blue areas are low smoking. You can also see that there are large sex differentials between, we see between men and women in many of these countries. Um, and you can also see that many of the industrialised uh, nations have, uh, uh, have begun solving their tobacco problem. So this is, I think, the good news and the bad news. So I'll just give you a moment to let you take that in. This is the graph of... Oops, sorry. This is a, a chart looking at smoking prevalence. So it's actually got uh, cigarette consumption according to 
trillions of cigarettes per year, and it's according to calendar year. So what you can actually see is um, very large amounts that have been smoked that have accumulated over the, over the previous century. But we can actually see declines in a number of countries in Europe and America. This is charted according to the WHO regions. But what you can also see is that smoking in China is overwhelming uh, smoking in many other parts of the world. The average Chinese, Chinese smoker smokes around 22 cigarettes a day, so it's not light smoking. And um, the amount consumed in China exceeds all of the low and middle income countries combined. If we look at the global burden of disease related to tobacco, it's the second leading cause of burden of disease after high blood pressure and above alcohol. It amounts to 6.3 million deaths per year. And that's actually more than 10% of the deaths worldwide are attributable to smoking. And we estimate that there's been about 100 million deaths attributable to tobacco in the 20th century, and there will be 1 billion in the 21st century if we continue to go the way that we are going. And I think of all of the causes that are listed there, it's readily preventable. Um, and it's getting worse. So we, we, we're probably going to go, if we keep on going the way we are, it's going to go from one in 10 deaths caused by smoking to one in six worldwide. One of the other things we've noticed is that worldwide, between countries and within countries, it's increasingly concentrated in the poor. And within the industrialised uh, countries, it's also increasingly concentrated among the mentally ill. In terms of the diseases that it causes, this is a, also from the Global Burden of Disease. And if you look at the column here, which is tobacco smoking, these colours represent the particular diseases. So the dark blue is cancer, the middle is cardiovascular disease and chronic respiratory disease. And what you can see is that the main uh, causes of the burden of disease there are, are spread across the increased risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease and chronic lung disease uh, caused by smoking. So as I mentioned uh, in the previous um, slide, there are stages to any sort of cigarette epidemic um, and the risks related to smoking change over time. So this really shows uh, a documented uh, <coughs> stages of the tobacco epidemic where these lines here are about the percentage of male smokers, then the percentage of female smokers, and then the percentage of male deaths, and the percentage of female deaths. And what you can see is sub-Saharan Africa is here at the moment. <coughs> We're here at the moment, which, is, which means we've had that surge in male smoking that's come down, the surge in female smoking that didn't quite get to the same level, and it's fallen down here. And then you can see that there are a number of other places that are at this stage, uh, earlier in the, in the epidemic. And what's quite sad is, I mean, Quite clearly, it, these countries don't have to go through the same thing that we went through. Um, but unfortunately, they, they seem to be doing that. So here's the success story in Australia. Australia has long been regarded as a dark market, um, and it's really because of our outstanding tobacco control. And I think there are a number of people in the room who've contributed to that over time. Um, we now have uh, a rate of adult smoking of around 13%. Uh, daily smokers, which is among the best in, in the industrialised world. But it's down from a peak of over three, of around three quarters of men um, in the 1940s and um, over around a third of women that peaked in, the in 1978. Um, and there are a number of different reasons why we uh, have this outstanding um, levels of tobacco control. The main things are to do with price and also legislation about where and when you can smoke. Um, and then, as you know, we've recently had the introduction of plain packaging. And it's been terrific to, um, to be an Australian talking about smoking internationally because there's massive interest uh, in the plain packaging. But also I think that uh, tobacco control measures uh, are one of Australia's great exports, but it's not really widely acknowledged. Um, one of the interesting things is if you look at the US packets, um, I actually have one in, in one of the earlier slides, but it just looks like that, I don't know if you remember the old kind of Marlboro packet, and then it says in, in gold writing on a white background, Surgeon General's warning, cigarette smoke contains carbon monoxide. <laughs> so obviously the air contains carbon monoxide. These are not, that's not a particularly strong health warning. But you can see that the Australian health warnings are really quite graphic. Um, but in spite of this, this, this is, this is a success story, but the success story means we actually have 2.7 million smokers in Australia. 
So there are a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of dialogue about moving to the tobacco end game, particularly the idea that once we get below 5% smoking, tobacco will become much more of a marginal activity, smoking will become much more of a marginal activity. And then there's, there's a whole debate about what kinds of strategies you can use beyond that point. So in keeping and in concert with those reductions in smoking and a number of other um, measures such as better control of uh, blood cholesterol and better control of blood pressure, Australia now has the most outstanding record in terms of um, premature mortality, particularly in men. So if you look at the graph here on the left, you can see that males, uh, the green is Australia and the blue is Japan. So you can actually see that in the late 1990s, Australia actually overtook Japan in terms of premature mortality in men. And this age group we look at, it's uh, age group 35 to 69. It's a sort of sentinel age group that we look at for premature mortality. There's only one country doing better than Australia in this regard, and that's Iceland. So in terms of our premature mortality, and, and that has you know, a, large, a, a reasonably <coughs> large contribution to that is our, our tobacco control. So even though we have this extraordinary record in tobacco control, we didn't actually have any large-scale data for Australia about what smoking was doing to our death rates. So um, this study was actually, the protocol was written for it in 2003. Uh, so, and then uh, a huge effort went into data collection over the ensuing 10-year period. Um, so you can see that it's, it's been a really large effort and, uh, and a large team involved. So the aim was to investigate the relationship of smoking to all-cause mortality, and by that I mean uh, regardless of cause, so it, include, it adds together cardiovascular disease deaths, cancer deaths, deaths from any cause in, in Australia in the 45 and up study cohort. So the 45 and up study cohort is a cohort of around 267,000 men and women who were recruited from the New South Wales general population from 2006 to 2009. They were aged 45 and over. Um, and we had around an 18% response rate. So that actually meant we had around 10% of the whole state were actually in the study. They completed a self-administered baseline questionnaire um, and they gave consent for linkage to health records. So in terms of the methods, I won't bore you with the, the statistical details, but it's essentially a cohort study. And that is where you sort of recruit people at baseline and you follow them over time. You, you ascertain their exposure at baseline, you follow them over time to see what happens to them. And in this case, uh, it's a bit ghoulish, but we just we waited for them to die, basically. Um, we excluded anyone who had missing data on smoking, and we also excluded people who, who were sick at baseline, because people who were sick at baseline would tend to have actually changed their smoking behaviour. They call that the sick quitter effect. So you actually find that your current smokers are depleted of people who are actually ill at the time because they've given up because they're sick. We followed up through the register of births, deaths and marriages to mid-2012. Tobacco smoking was ascertained on the questionnaire by asking the question, have you ever been a regular smoker? And then subcategorising people according to how old they were when they started, whether they were currently a smoker, what age they were if they quit, if they had quit, and then how many cigarettes they smoked per day. And this is a, a question that's similar to other large-scale questionnaire, other large-scale studies internationally. This gives you a sort of schema of the way that we looked at it. This is when they completed their baseline survey and we followed them, that, that was over the time they completed their, their survey and then we had the linked data on death all the way up to 2012. We also looked backwards at their hospital records um, for some analyses so that we could actually exclude people who had chronic respiratory, who had uh, respiratory disease um, as, it's called a sensitivity analysis, it was just to really check that our findings were robust. So we used for the statistics, as Alan's here, statistical methods. We used Cox proportional hazards modelling with age as the underlying time variable. And we adjusted for a number of factors which might um, influence the relationship of smoking to mortality. We also estimated the effect of, uh, of smoking on um, people's life expectancy. And we, also, and we looked at men and women separately. And we also looked according to year of birth. So we looked at people born in different decades to see if the effect of smoking on mortality varied. And that was really to look at whether we had a, a stable epidemic of smoking. And we did, as I said, a number of sensitivity analyses to just check our findings were robust. So we ended up with over 200,000 participants after we'd excluded those people. And we, because we'd followed them for 4.3 years, we had what's called a total of 874,000 person years. So that's really multiplying each person by the amount of time we had for them. 
there were around six, uh, 5,600 deaths. And this graph here shows the proportion of current smokers, former smokers, and never smokers. And what you can see is in keeping with the low rates of smoking in the general population, and also the fact that this group is 45 and over, we only had about 8% current smokers. So it's actually a pretty low proportion of the population current smokers. And these <coughs> are the main findings. So this graph, um, this uh, vertical line here is the line of no effect, and this blocks to this side indicate an increased risk com um, compared to the reference group, and blocks, if we had any blocks this side, it would indicate a preventive um, effect. This is the um, never smokers, so we're always comparing people who smoked to people who had never smoked. And what you can see first is for men, we found that men who were current smokers had around 2.8 times the risk of dying during that follow-up period than men who had never smoked. And for women, it was around 3.1 compared to that risk of um, people who'd never smoked. People who were pr former smokers didn't have a risk that was as high as current smokers, but they had an increased risk compared to the people who had never smoked. And if you compared the men and women, if you look, this is called the confidence interval, which is really the, the range that that estimate would be expected to be in. There's no significant difference between men and women in terms of the risks uh, of mortality related to smoking. So the general adage is, if women smoke like men, they'll die like men. There used to be uh, ideas that that wouldn't happen. So then, this is a very busy slide, but it's really looking at risks according to um, birth decade. So these are people born in 1920 to 1929, and these are the more recent um, people born more recently in 1950 to 1959. And these are the, those same relative risks looking in the never smokers, former smokers, and current smokers. And the only thing to take home there is actually the risks and patterns were very similar. So what that suggests is actually there's a stable epidemic. Um, it doesn't really matter what decade you're born in. If, you're, if you are a long-term smoker, your risks of dying are similar compared to people who had never smoked. Um, so, and, and that's really a product of the fact that people who are, who are smoking now have been smoking for a long time. There's a general stabilisation in the age that people commence smoking. So if you imagine back in the 60s, quite a lot of people who smoked in the 60s actually started smoking when they were in their 20s and they hadn't smoked for very long. We just think that the people who are in 45 and over now, pretty much all of them started smoking in their mid to late teens and they've smoked quite heavily that whole time. So we've got this sort of actual, it's called a kind of realisation of the true hazards of smoking. This is the um, age standardised rates of all-cause mortality according to the intensity of smoking. So this is the number of cigarettes per day. This is zero cigarettes per day. And um, these are people who are smoking around a pack of cigarettes a day. The bottom line is women and the top line is men. And what you can see from this is that um, as you smoke more, your, relative, your death rates increase. You can also see that men in general have higher death rates than women. But what's really interesting is a lot of people who would consider themselves to be light smokers, those smoking 14 or fewer cigarettes a day, actually have a doubling in their risk of dying during the follow-up period. Um, and that's actually similar to the risks of dying related to being morbidly obese. So it's similar to having a body mass index of 35 or more and also the, the relative risk of death associated with drinking a bottle of vodka a day. So I think people, when they think that they're a light smoker, they do really tend to underestimate how lethal smoking is. That's not to say you should drink a bottle of vodka a day, by the way. Uh, and when you're talking about people who smoke 25 cigarettes a day or more, you're really looking at a four to five fold increase in the risk of death over the follow up period. So, Here's the good news. This is about what happens if you quit. So this line here is the relative risk for never smokers. This is the line for current smokers. And this is the age at stopping smoking. And what we've done here is to plot uh, the relative risks in people who quit smoking at these different ages. And, what, and, and we, we didn't really go up beyond age um, 45 because you also get into the sort of sick quitter effect there that people tend to be quitting if they're sick. So what you see here is that quitting at any of these ages, and even if we were to continue, quitting at any of these ages is much, much better than continuing to smoke. But also, if you quit before age 45, your risks don't differ significantly compared to someone who had never smoked. So that's not to say that you should smoke your heart out until you get to 45 and then stop. But it is saying that actually you can avoid a huge proportion of the excess mortality risks if you um, 
give up smoking by the age of 45. This is applying all of those relative risks to a typical life expectancy in Australia for men and for women. And what you can see is that 45% of male smokers will be dead by the age of 75, uh, compared to around 19% of people who had never smoked. And you can see for women it's around a third of smokers will be dead by the age of 75, compared to around 12% of people who had never smoked. And on average, uh, smokers lose around 10 years of their life expectancy. So this is the risk of all-cause mortality. Um, for the next analyses that we're going to be doing, we will be looking at cause-specific mortality, but we've been waiting for data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. But we do know from other data that the excess deaths in smokers are by and large caused by smoking. So um, it's easier to name the parts of the body that are not affected by smoking than it is to name those that are affected. This is a sort of stylized list of all of the parts of the body that are affected by smoking. These are data from the Million Women study, which Simon has already mentioned. And what they show is the relative risk of death according to different causes. And so you can actually see for chronic lung disease, it wasn't actually able to be fitted on this graph. It's around a 35-fold increase in the risk for, of death from chronic lung disease in smokers compared to non-smokers. Then you come to around a 21-fold increase for cancer of the lung and many, many other uh, conditions. And, and this one here is um, coronary heart disease, which has around a five-fold increase in risk. So we do know that when we observe that increased risk of um, premature mortality in, uh, in smokers, that, um, that m the vast majority of those will be caused by smoking. So the conclusion that we can come to from these first Australian findings are, first of all, there's a low prevalence of smoking. And we, we already knew that from a lot of data from Australian Bureau of Statistics. We also know that the relative risk of dying during follow-up in the current smokers is three times that of never smokers. And this actually means that up to two-thirds of the deaths in smokers can be directly attributable to smoking. That means of the 2.7 million smokers in Australia, around 1.8 million of them would be expected to die from their habit if they continue to smoke. It also shows that the benefits of quitting um, are large, particularly compared to continuing to smoke, the earlier the better you quit. And around a uh, 10 year estimated average reduction in life expectancy for smokers compared to people who have never smoked. Now I just want to talk a bit about the comparison with the international data and also comparison with what we already knew. Because as I said before, it says it on the packet. So it's important to uh, know how these data contribute. So as I've said, there is variation in the relative risk of mortality, that figure of threefold varies according to country and it varies according to time. And it's influenced by a variety of factors. Particularly it's influenced by smoking patterns. So in places where people, where the population's only taken up smoking for relatively recently and people smoke small amounts, uh, the relative risks related to smoking are less. The other thing is in countries with very high death rates in never smokers, you actually find there's less of a difference between the smokers and the non-smokers. So, when we look back at this cigarette epidemic, I'm just going to take you through using the British doctor's study, uh, the relative risks relating to this, this overall epidemic. But you can, you can imagine that if you're comparing the, the death rates here um, between the smokers and the non-smokers, that you'll actually end up with a narrower, you'll end up with it being narrow earlier in the death epidemic. So if we look at the British doctor's study, which was a study um, led by uh, Professor Sir Richard Dole, um, and this is the 50-year follow-up. So it was the very earliest study to actually follow people forward who were smokers and to look at the risks of lung cancer and of death. Um, and Sir Richard Dole was a smoker when he did his first studies, um, but when he saw his first cross-tabulation, we call it, when he first looked at the risks in smokers and non-smokers, he stopped that actual day. So, so that's evidence into practice, immediate. So what you can see here is that during the 1950s and 60s, the age standardised mortality rate in the lifelong non-smokers was about 80, and in the cigarette smokers it was 93. And so the ratio of those, those rates is 1.2. So instead of the threefold difference, it was 1.2. When you get to the 1980s, it's around 2, the relative risk. And then when you get to the 1990s, it's around 3. It's around what we find. So it's this evolution of risks. And what you can see is for the lifelong non-smokers, the age standardised death rate went from 80 to 40. 
So it's actually even in the non-smokers, all the other improvements in health cause that big drop in mortality. Um, and it's particularly driven by drops in cardiovascular disease mortality, but a lot of other things like injuries, accidents. Look at what happened in the cigarette smokers. It actually increased. So you can see why that gap between the current smokers and the non-smokers changed. So how does our finding of uh, the threefold increase in risk compare with the international data? Well, I find it quite amazing how well it lines up if you consider that our data were from the general population of New South Wales people filling in a questionnaire and being followed over time. So if you look at Richard Dole's findings, the relative risk in men in current versus never smokers is around 2.83 we get 2.82, so it's remarkably similar. If you look in women, the Million Women study um, gets around 2.8. Uh, studies from the US, um, both uh, 3.0 and 2.8, and we get around 3.1. So, and, and what they find is around, also around two thirds of deaths are attributable to smoking. So remarkably similar results. And the reason these are similar is that all of these places so the UK and the US also has a mature epidemic of smoking. So they're at that stage four in the epidemic where um, they've actually realised the, the sort of general consequences of smoking. All of the smokers have started smoking at a young age. They smoked intensively um, and, uh, and so the adverse effects are quite similar. They also find, and I won't take you through all of these graphs, but these are all of the ones looking at life expectancy, and it's actually fairly consistent, a 10-year reduction in average life expectancy as well. So how does how do the evolution, evolution of smoking risks really pan out? Well, if you look at the proportion of smokers likely to be killed by smoking, it was around one in six in the 1960s, around half in the 1980s, and we're now up to two thirds. So in the 1960s, it was like tossing, it was like throwing a dice. In the 1980s, it was like tossing a coin. And in the, well, the 21st century, I didn't quite know what to say at this point, but I think it probably is that it's time to stop gambling. <laughs> because really, at this point, the odds are stacked against you. And I suppose I think this then brings us to the point of why magnitude matters. Why does it matter that instead of it being a half, which is really the estimates that we've been using worldwide, and we're now up to two thirds. And obviously these findings came out in um, February, so it's not really uh, translated yet into the general consciousness. Well, why is it different? Why does it half versus two thirds? And I think the first thing is that there's a lot in our consciousness about the balance of probabilities. I think if something is 50-50, it means something quite different from it being two thirds. And that's, the, that's true in law, in civil law. But it's also, I think, uh, a realisation that you're unlikely to get away with it. And, and at the same time as, um, as really highlighting the, that the harms are greater than we thought, it also means that the benefits of quitting are greater than we thought. And the other thing it means is if one person quits, or if you support one person to quit, the chances are you've actually saved a life. And I think that it's not often that we have policies and regulations that save lives, but I think that if the ANU going smoke-free actually encourages one person to quit, you can be pretty sure that you've actually contributed to someone not having a premature death. So I would say here that it does matter, that magnitude matters and that there is a big difference between half and one and two thirds. And I can, you can see there, this is the US cigarette packet with the uh, gold writing on the white background. <coughs> and you can contrast that with the Australian one where um, it, you know, it's graphic in the extreme. So how did we get here? Um, <coughs> Well, the first thing is that smoking is highly addictive. There are plenty of examples of people who've managed to quit heroin who've not been able to quit smoking. Um, the other thing that is that we're in this situation really for historical reasons. So smoking became widespread and it became embedded in a lot of cultures at a time when we really didn't know that it was harmful. Um, and as you can see here, um, there was quite a belief that actually smoking was good for you. Uh, so when smoking really took off. But it is true that the majority, the vast majority of smokers wish that they had never started. Um, so people also tend to take on smoking at a time when they're not really thinking about the long-term effects. Um, and it's very, very difficult to quit. The other thing is that um, as a product, uh, 
cigarettes were introduced at a time when our regulation system, our regulatory system was not as strong. So if you imagine now going to the FDA and saying, I've got this product, it's going to kill about two thirds of the people who do it. Uh, they'll take it up when they're kids. Um, you know, there's pretty much no part of the body that it doesn't harm. Uh, what do you reckon? Um, so you can see that at the time when it was really grandfathered, it's been sort of grandfathered in and it, it, was, it, was, it was passed by the FDA, I think in the early part of the 20th century. So it was really a time when uh, things like this could get through. And the other thing it speaks to actually is our priorities because by allowing, I mean, it is, it is actually an industry. People are actively profiting from it. Um, and you can say there are components of that in other health problems, but it's not the same. This isn't like an Ebola outbreak or a tsunami. It's, it's actually people actively, companies actively marketing this in order to make a profit. And their mission is to make more people smoke. Um, so we have chosen in whatever way to prioritise that ability to trade and that ability to make money over health in a lot of different settings. So uh, this is a photo of the house of the former CEO, Australian CEO of Philip Morris. Um, at the time it went to auction, it was expected to fetch $45 million. So I do sometimes ask how people sleep at night, but I think they sleep with the sound of the ocean sometimes. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of the use of these findings, um, they're clearly part of a broader, longer effort. And I think there are plenty of people in this room who can really tell the story of that effort. Uh, so it's really just one part of a, a, a much bigger picture. But I have to say that there was enormous excitement among the tobacco advocacy, tobacco control advocacy people about the fact that we would finally have Australian data. And there was also a recognition that the release of this evidence was in itself a public health action. So that you could just sort of publish it quietly um, and maybe hope the media would pick it up, but that probably wouldn't have the kind of impact than if it was sort of integrated into a more general awareness. So a lot of planning went into actually releasing the findings in a way that would maximise their impact. We had partner organisations actually uh, embedded in the research. So we had people from the Cancer Council and the Heart Foundation actually who were authors on the paper and, and we worked with them to look at the best ways of framing the evidence. We also had early consultation with the key players or they're also known as the usual suspects, these people. And in fact, Simon Chapman, when he was talking about the plain packaging, he did say that the one thing was missing was a scratch and sniff thing which had the smell of rotting lungs in it. <laughs> so he's a... Uh, and Michael Moore's here, so he's one of the people that we, um, we contacted as well. Mike Daub was particularly helpful in terms of framing things about um, the numbers of smokers and the numbers of smokers who'd be uh, likely to die if they didn't quit. We actually also had a, a really very specific written media strategy about how, who to approach, how and how to do it. And there were multiple press releases that came out. So I'll just give you some examples of what happened. So we did end up with over 900 media articles, and I understand that that's actually considered pretty good. Um, we had a lot of national and international interest um, across the board. And we're actually quite interested in monitoring whether this particular release of findings actually had an impact on quit rates. Um, because it's, it, cause often research per se doesn't necessarily have an impact. Um, but it's, it, we're just interested to see if one kind of shock like that can actually have an impact. Um, coinciding with Western Australian, actually, and ACOSH, which is a coalition of anti-smoking groups, put out a full-page ad in the Western Australian, really just highlighting that the news was, was worse than people thought. Um, and we've also been following just different bits and pieces of people picking up, in, um, up on the findings to use them for their work. So I had a conversation with someone who said that Quit Victoria had been saying that it's been enormously helpful for their work to be able to cite Australian data. And this is one of my favourite examples of policy translation. So Bronwyn King is um, a radiation oncologist who was working on a daily basis with people who were dying from lung cancer. But she was horrified to find that her super fund was actually investing in tobacco. So she, she then went to her sort of super fund and said, have you considered divesting? And since that time, she's actually convinced 28 Australian super funds to divest at least $1.3 billion from tobacco companies. And when I went to a meeting, she sort of collared me and said, I use your findings every single day. I use them with my patients. 
and I also use them in my tobacco divestment work. And she also highlighted the importance of having Australian data about the Australian epidemic. So I think that brings me now to the ANU smoke free. Um, and I particularly like this picture because I think the clarity of the air in Canberra and the clarity of the air in this picture really highlights the perfect still <laughs> autumn day. Um, I think that the smoke free policy really highlights the importance of having not only those high level policies that are to do with uh, regulation, particularly in terms of tobacco price, where people can smoke. But it's going to make no difference if we don't have that granular effort, that effort of individual people to quit smoking and individual people to work um, to help people to quit and also people to resist the pressure to smoke. So I think that um, I'd like to conclude uh, particularly by acknowledging the people who are, are really putting in the hard yards to, to actually keep us uh, on track. Um, and particularly, I'm particularly um, grateful to um, you know, the ANU for actually sort of putting their money where their mouth is. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the people who've made this possible. I know that it was, you know, the protocol was written in, in 2003, but if you think about all the person years that each one of those participants put in, it's been an enormous effort. I'd particularly like to acknowledge and embarrass Grace Joshi, who's just there in the audience. She actually did all of the analyses, and it's one of the great things about ANU is to have really, really top-notch statisticians, so you know you can, I can go to Oxford happily with the findings and know that they'll stand that, up to that test. Really terrific team. And um, all of the different uh, organisations who supported uh, the, the study itself. And I'd particularly like to thank the ANU because one of the consequences of doing something uh, that other people think is obvious and doing research where it says it on the packet is that you're absolutely dependent on your institution which supports uh, researchers rather than individual research findings and who can see the value above and beyond uh, sort of whether something is perceived as novel. Um, and I think that that really takes us beyond research and well into action. Thank you. <laughs>